I can't tell you how excited I am to talk about one of my favorite subjects. Um, I'm really excited that I can even get this excuse. I kind of figured I would um, walk through a little bit about the uh, history, a little bit uh, about some of the features, maybe some of its value to both, you know, uh, that we've seen through the industry and, and to personally now I'm going to kind of talk about some uh, very specific lists. Uh, it's always fun to say that with an S, right? Um, <laughs> I think a lot of people look at lists as, oh, there's just a list. It's like, no, there's, uh, there's enough variation in there uh, that's similar to the difference between, say, Ruby and Python. You know? uh, for us list heads, those are the same language. You know, it's like, tell the difference between a congregationalist and a, uh, and a list of alien. It's like, they look the same. <laughs> and then uh, kind of address some of those concerns. Maybe this could be more of a roundtable discussion. And then I'll dive a little bit in the list. Now, I do have to kind of giggle because I have to disqualify myself. I am not uh, a professional list packer. Um, that I don't even have any kind of a crusade that I push. Um, I mean, I'm not even smug, and that seems to be for a lot of people a very uh, unprofessional. You know. um, I think my only qualification is that I'm just extremely good looking. <laughs> <laughs> but it's only because I'm giving a talk. <laughs> Alright, so uh, the only takeaway that I'd like everyone to have from this slide is one, that list is old, I mean, this is over 50 years. The other thing, when you look at this history, is it's not just old. There's been a lot of quite revolutionary things happening very recently. So this is a very active ecosystem. seem to have stolen things over the years. Um, in fact, let me kind of tell you my own personal story. I thought, as a kid, programming machine language, C, this sort of stuff, learned C in college, or, or learned Lisp in college, fell in love with it. It's like this mountain of wonderful stuff. But once I graduated, then it was, um, the industry didn't need large applications. What we needed were device drivers and network protocols. And so, use this, uh, went back to C. And the problem is it's considerably limited. There's a lot of features in this that are really missed. In fact, I think we all did. So, you know, we start stealing data encapsulation and, oh, garbage collection, that it should be nice. <laughs> and dynamic languages and variables that could have any type. Wonderful, right? And so we just kept stealing all of those good ideas. Now, is there anything left? Perhaps. I think so. Um, but more to the point, why? What, why was so much innovation happening in this ecosystem uh, for so many years? And I think I've got a thesis here for, for a couple of reasons. Um, one, Lisp has a very simple syntax, very, very easy. And it has this mathematical basis, the same way that uh, SQL does, right? Um, and that, I think, is the key thing, because what you can do is you can roll your own language real quick. Um, there's a, a guy here in town who just on a whim uh, decided to write a list, similar, and uh, to port it into JavaScript. He kind of did it on a whim, and the whole thing kind of came together over a weekend. It's that easy to do. Well, once you can write your own language uh, in an afternoon, well, then you can try new ideas. I mean, this is one thing that um, uh, Steele and Sussman did. You know, there was this uh, 
guy came up with this idea called actors. I don't know if you've heard of it, but uh, back in 72, we wrote a paper on it, and they were thinking, hey, that sounds like a fun idea. Let's write our own list in order to try these actors out. And that's how we got Scheme, which was uh, you know, quite a unique uh, list. So now, once you have uh, your own language, you try new ideas, you can come up with things, you publish, and then we can continue to steal. Uh, there's, a, there's this guy, David Nolan, who constantly just goes through the old papers written in the 70s and 80s and even in the 60s. And like, Ooh, that's a good idea, and he ports it now. Because all this stuff is just kind of written in the list, and he just enjoys gleaning all these really good ideas. All right, so more to the point. Why is it in, you know, why is this kind of important to any of us? Well, I think it's kind of the same reason. Uh, so if you you kind of look at um, the list as kind of a color, right? This weird syntax. It's kind of like a Zen cone. It'll fill your mind. What is the sound of one hand clapping? Well, of course if I said that I know what you'll say, it's like, oh yeah. No, but <laughs> It really is that that change that that will get you out of your comfort zone. Now, um, Slava here has this uh, this quote about how much effort it is, as if it is a religious journey. I don't think I want to give that impression to anyone. I think Lisp itself is actually quite fun. I think when I say the word fun, it's kind of like chess. It's very easy to learn, right? I taught my uh, boy how to play chess and. By the time he was four, he was a pretty good player. Uh, but it takes kind of a lifetime to really master it. So, you know, look at the, it might be a little longer term. But I do think it's worth the effort. Uh, I got this great quote. Uh, the novelist studies poetry uh, to be a better novelist, right? And the same way programmers should learn list to make you a better programmer. Um, that, um, What's the guy who wrote uh, Ruby Matsumoto? Matsum you can hear on Matsumoto. Yeah. I can never pronounce his name. Matt. Right. Yeah. <laughs> Matt. That's what he said. So uh, Matt has been quoted as saying that's how he learned how to program is by reading through the Emacs Lisp code. And that's where he kind of comes to. So let me uh, talk about some uh, of the four of the lists. There's a whole bunch of them. I'll just hit uh, these four here. And kind of if you want to start playing with them, my personal recommendation has to go. So when it comes to common lists, this is kind of, you know, what you might call the granddaddy of all of them. But uh, there's a new book that came out called The Lambs of Lists. It's really a good book. It starts off with uh, just a bunch of games, essentially, that you, you program uh, in lists. And um, yeah, so I recommend using this book. Uh, and then as far as getting started with it, uh, it's, it's available like on my Mac. I could just type through install seamless and the way it comes. Typically, you know, you're kind of, I think we're all used to running the interpreter with the file that we want to run. That's normally not how we do lists. We usually just start it up and then start to load in our programs. But, um, now, um, this book here to learn Scheme, come on, this is. This is my Bible. This is my scripture. I mean, I'm in awe of this book. I still have it. Um, I still love it. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, I think I might recommend this book a little bit more. Uh, the Little Schemer is a fantastically well-written book. I don't know if you've seen it. Um, but you know, page two is, is this. It starts off with kind of a Socratic dialogue with the with the reader. So it asks a question on one side, gives you the answer on the other. And as you go through, it starts to kind of build up, like, you know, what is the car of L, where L is this argument? Well, do you know what a car is? Well, probably not, but you don't have to. It just says, well, it's just the first eye. Okay, now I got it. And that's kind of how the whole book goes about. Um, and then there's a couple of sequels to it that are equally as good. So I do recommend this as a fun book, and by the end of it, you'll be your person um, If you want to uh, actually try Scheme out, I do recommend a flavor of Scheme called Racket. It's got a fantastic IDE. 
uh, called Dr. Rackin. Um, there's the URL. But you can also uh, try Guile. Guile is the GNU scheme implementation that they've embedded in just quite a few, uh, quite a few applications. Um, can't be remiss without talking about Emacs Lisp. Uh, Emacs is, you know, everybody's heard of it, but it's essentially a Lisp interpreter. And so you can really learn Lisp just by starting up Emacs and uh, going through the online book. This book is just embedded in it, so you can just um, type control H I and go down to the E list thing and start to read and then you go. Now the other list I'll mention is, is Closure. This is a, a very new uh, list and, uh, as a newcomer. Um, it solves a lot of the I don't know, maybe I'd call it the age of Lisp. Uh, it didn't have to maintain backward compatibility, so it could kind of address some things that kind of were annoying. For instance, car. What does car mean? Most people who even use uh, Lisp don't, don't know. They just know it. it gives you the top of the list. Well, it's a very important thing. We use it all the time, but we don't know why it's called car. I mean, some people do. Gary can tell us. But, uh, you know, okay, we can, we can go past that. We can call it first. That sounds like a better name. So they kind of address some of those things. You don't have just lists, you have uh, maps and other things that are built into the language. If you want to learn this one, um, I do recommend going through this kind of step right here. Uh, there's an online site where you can ask your questions in kind of like that Socratic way. Here's a question, a problem, solve it. It's pretty obvious. It gets a little more in depth as you go along. Um, the closure cones are pretty good. They're a little bit more advanced. Uh, you can even just try running and, and compiling closure right on a, a website where you just type it in and you'll evaluate it. So it's very nice. But uh, if you want to install it, um, Linux is kind of the way it's done. It's just a shell script, and you just you, know, you grab the shell script real quick with a groom install, and then from then on you can use it to create projects and build things up. So, I'm sure you have a list of your own concerns about learning less. So these are <laughs> ones I kind of came up with. Uh, what's up with parentheses? Uh, come on, parentheses, they're just hugs. <laughs> 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 uh, this does seem to be a big issue, and it really shouldn't. I mean, it's just because the parentheses are on the wrong side of the function. No, really. Um, on one hand, it does make it much more simpler, uh, but everything, keep in mind, everything is a function. There are no operators, so you don't have to worry about operator precedence or anything like that, which, boy, I've got to admit, those, you, you thought it was tough before, try Scala, I mean, good grief, it's like, I can never keep track of which the order of the precedence for those operators, there's so many of them. Does it have libraries? This was an issue for me when I uh, when I was starting out. Um, yeah, mainly because the Clojure uh, library is built on top of the JVM, so Clojure can just call everything that you kind of expect you can get out of, uh, out of Java. Can you use it work? Maybe. Uh, there are some that are using it. Obviously, um, Clojure is an easier easier way to get things in because it does use the standard JVM with all those libraries. So you can just kind of wrap something on top of it. Do I have to use Emacs? No, but uh, paredit, which is kind of something you got to use, uh, has been ported to bin. you got to use that to follow those parentheses straight. Okay, let's try a, a deeper dive. And this is totally against my better judgment to try doing live coding in front of people. So please be with you, bear with me. Um, but I really thought it might help out if, uh, at first I thought, well, I'll just have some really impressive list of code. Well, that won't impress anybody, and nobody will care. And I thought I'd try the tutorial, but once again, that's, uh, I don't think I've got enough time for something like that. But I did think that if I just wrote a little list of code, it would kind of start to make it a little more familiar. So it won't be quite as strange. So let's. Um, Let's try problem one here. This is just a, a little problem that I uh, came up with from Project Euler. 
So if you think about uh, trying to come up with a function and figure out what's a factor, uh, what's a factor or a multiple of three. Now in Python here, you see on the top left, that's kind of how a pretty expected way we would write something like that, right? You just use the modulus operator, see if it's equal to zero, and return true. However, you know, if you've got this statement, well, it's already doing the conditional, so we could probably write that same function just that way. Right, where we just return the results of the conditional and we're getting our true and false. Um, now there's some languages like uh, this bottom one here is CoffeeScript. And CoffeeScript, you know, takes a more functional approach. So every function automatically returns a value. So you, you notice the difference between the Python code and, 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 the, job, and the CoffeeScript is really the lack of the word return. And that's kind of a list is right there is that Everything is an expression, so everything just automatically returns, and we expect that. All right, so let's start up a environment here. Just coming up. Now, I guess I should explain. In, in list, you really expect there to be a REPL. Now, REPL stands for read, evaluate, print, and then loop and do it again. Um, it's amazing how long it took before we just kind of expect that type of behavior. Now, I mean, when you start at Python, that's what you get. That Python really is an even better REPL. Um, but it allows me to type in things and try things out. What does 42 give me? 42. This hey, great, this works. Um, I can even try things like uh, see what a list gives me. All right, a list, function list gives me a list. Great. So, try a shortcut, that's the little apostrophe. It does the same thing. So I can kind of play around with things. I can even go through um, writing some function calls and exploring libraries and that sort of thing directly right from my recipe. Now this is not how most, uh, most people would want to write, right? You kind of want to start doing that sort of thing in a file where you can save it off. But that's the same thing here, right? So I can type in something in my file that I'm going to save and then I can actually send it down to that rep and get the same sort of evaluation. Okay, so that's how I'll try to do it. All right, let's um, now uh, the list that I'm going to use is, is closure, just because it's fun at the moment for me. Uh, and closure is uh, the only downside to it is that their function calls are called definite. I always liked it better when it was defined. Fun. What you're doing? You're defining some fun. <laughs> All right, let's try uh, naming a trip. Uh, yeah, you'll notice that there's a question mark. Uh, since this really only cares about parentheses, everything else is free game. And so if you do a predicate function where you're going to return true or false, uh, we often just put a question mark at the end. It tells us what we're doing. And then uh, the first thing in a, in a function is the document string that we're doing And we'll take parameter x, and now we'll do something with um, it. Let's see. What we want is the same kind of thing we saw in the, Python, in the Python code, which is a mod, but we don't have operators in those. We have functions. So it's a function called mod. And we could do things like for and Oh, hey, let's evaluate and see what that comes up with. One, perfect, that's, that's it. But we want three, and we really want to see the Okay, now, we want to compare this to zero. Again, we don't have uh, an operator called equals, but we do have a, there we go, we do have a function called equals. Now, in closure, they use the double equals. Some uh, other uh, list quite common ones. You'll have what, five, six different equals, right? But 
concept. It's, I mean, it takes two parameters, the first and the second. So the first, obviously, uh, well, we want to compare it to zero. And one to here is just sub that in. And actually, I think I'd rather have this. So. And let's see how this one's going to look. Is that true? It is. It's eight. False. It is. All right. We've accomplished problem one. Thank you very much. Okay. Let's try number two. Let's list all the numbers that are multiples of three that are less than ten. Okay. Not a problem. Let's start off with the function. Triples. Now, mm, first thing we want to do is have a bunch of numbers that we filter out. There we go. That's what we want. We want to use the filter function. Um, now, this function takes two arguments. First one is some sort of predicate function that will limit everything, and then another one is the two numbers we want to filter. Wait, we already have our predicate function, don't we? Triple. Question mark. Perfect. Now we just need a list of numbers. Well, um, there's this thing called range. Now range is just the same as you expect from other languages, uh, like Python and Ruby and CoffeeScript and yeah, just about all of them have this sort of thing. So if I say range of 10, I get 10 numbers. Yeah. Really want to. There. There we go, now we get 1 to 9, everything less than 10. Hey, am I done? Let's see. All triples. What does that give us? Gives me the numbers. Excellent. Let's change that to 100. And there's my numbers, and we can bonus, we can count. There happens to be a function called count, and it just happens to take this stuff, and it'll count them. You knew there were 33 already. Where's the limit argument you use for the all triples? Yeah, I'm yeah. Oh, it hasn't right. been evaluated. Make no attention to the bad. There we go. All right. My bad. <laughs> I forgot. I forgot to change that part. Why was it working? Yeah, because uh, I preloaded it. I wasn't going to trust my typing. <laughs> 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 Come on. Uh, you can actually compile a bunch of movies. Yeah. Thank you for that. That's like the primary stuff. Yeah, yeah. Uh, well, yeah, I, I was hoping you wouldn't see the man behind the curtain. But oh well. <laughs> yeah, live, live coding is always a bad idea, so I wasn't going to take any chances. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. All right, so let's move on to number three. Let's list all the natural numbers that are three or five that are less than a thousand. Okay, so this is the actual project you were problem. Um, this is the first one. And, um, you know, the first thing you would think to do is something that looks more like this. Where we have a function, say, called multiple, and it takes two parameters, and then we have a triple and a quintuple that we just call it. Um, now, I should do it that way. But it's not as much fun. And I'm really tempted to do something more interesting. But since I'm a sinner, I usually give in to my temptations real quick. <laughs> so let's start off with that uh, that multiple thing. But instead of just doing the work, I mean, okay, so let's get back to what we had before. And we're going to have that zero, and that sounds all fun. Oh, you and have the 
Pardon? You need a maximum parameter. That's what I'm getting at. Okay. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to create a function. And what I'm doing here. is this function is going to return a function. And it's going to return a function that things like triple will need. Now, if you don't eat it, uh, you know, because I'm just rambling on here, I don't blame you at all. But it allows me to write things like this, where I call the multiple, it's going to return a function, and then I just assign it using the def. Um, so, def n is really a combination of two parts. There's a function part and an assignment part. And so I've split it up. So I'm using just the f n part here. I love f n. And then the def part down here. And that does allow me to kind of finish off with, um, uh, we should probably have a function. This would be an or, just say the or, or, More function here. And this one's going to be the same sort of thing. We're going to filter. This time we'll use the And we're going to this time. <laughs> okay. All triple workman tuples up to a hundred thousand. Now let's sum them, because that's what they wanted to do. Now to sum, though, I can't just use the addition function, because it expects everything to just be passed in individually. Um, so what I have to do here is use the apply function. Uh, this is the same as in JavaScript and some other languages, where you can just take a, a list and convert that list of something into arguments for whatever you call it. There's the answer. Oh, I swore that I wouldn't have to tell the answer when I signed up for Project Euler. They wanted everybody to figure it out. But since they got hacked last week and they're no <laughs> longer online, I guess it doesn't matter. <laughs> so, um, so, questions? <laughs> Discussion? I had lots of little ones, I think. I do remember sitting outside out of a college class with, um, with my Sussman and Avalon book, reading this thing, and, and realizing that the first chapter is, is the only chapter they use to explain this. They have, they, one, one chapter, and, and you should be good from then on. And then the rest of it is just about computers and Joe. And I remember just looking at it going, wow, this is amazing what you can do already. And when they got to the recursive part, that was, I think, probably the first of their thing. It's not much common. I remember sitting in my office on my desk, and doing the working on the first countermeasure algorithm. And all of a sudden, I could see the word dimensions. Now see, amazing thing. old guys like us, when we tell the younger <laughs> kids, learn it, it'll be good for you, and they say, what am I going to get from it? It's like, you'll only know it once you read it. 
Why don't you try? <laughs> <laughs> but I think it. Uh, it's kind of like learning Latin, where you don't get to apply it necessarily every day, but it helps you understand how your own language is constructed. Or, yeah, that's a, that's a good one. Or, for instance, I have heard taking certain psychedelics can change the way you look at the world forever. <laughs> I've heard the same thing. I've heard the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> it was like, oh, I voice <laughs> <laughs> and, and, and it's true, I did uh, way too much LDS in the free speech movement at Berkeley, um, and the fact that LISP and LDS start with the same L's. Yeah. <laughs> 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 Apple, like so you can run it on the JVM, right? But it's got this kind of different orientation. So what real world work type thing do you do with it? Uh, good question. I think why it's becoming kind of popular right now is the kind of problems we're trying to solve. Right now we've got what 400 cores in our you know little MacBook Airs, right? Um, how do you actually code to use all of that? Well, if you're Writing in a typical object-oriented fashion, where you've got objects that hold state, each one of these instances have a different state. Now you have to reason about them when you don't know what they are. And um, one of the things that is very uh, clever about closure is once you create something, you can't change it. Everything is immutable. Uh, every list, every map, everything is immutable. And they really worked hard to make that efficient so that you can kind of change them, you, but you only change them by your um, view of it. So, like at that one point, you've got a list, and you can have multiple threads accessing that list. And if you are going to change it, it basically gives you a copy of your version. Everybody else has the same thing uh, that they had before. Well, this allows you to do multi threading very easily because you don't worry about that sort of stuff. It's functional. Everything goes in, comes out. And that is really why I think a lot of people are looking at something like Clojure. It's like, oh, I can take advantage of the speed of the, of the JVM, and yet I can get all this concurrency, this multi-threading, and all this other sort of stuff much easier. So it's got like functional purity in that sense. Yeah. There, there you go. You want to repeat that a little louder for everyone? I think Facebook's UI is now the written name closure script. Oh, okay. Um, as well as their, their UI framework. Which is kind of the mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Didn't know that. Uh, so a lot of the stuff that you were just saying about concurrency and immutability also applies to Haskell. But I tried to learn Haskell and my brain bounced hard off of monads. Um, is that a problem I'm going to have when I try to learn this for closure or something else? Monads are monads. Um, will, this, will this facilitate my learning in some way that Haskell may do? You know what I think would be good is to, to study both. That way you'll have two perspectives on the same problem. Um, is Lisp easier to learn than Haskell? I, I don't know if I could answer that. Uh, the beauty of Haskell is the same as the beauty of Lisp, and that it's completely different, so it might be good for it, right? To see something that's not, um, yeah. And, and maybe, I, I mean, I don't know Haskell you know, super well, I, I, at all. Um, <laughs> not spelled. You've heard of it, right? I've heard it. But, 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 but um, uh, the, the impression I have, you know, comparing the lists to, to, to something like Haskell, they, they, you know, Haskell, they, they, they took pure, pure function all the way to the ground, right? And so they had to have a way of encapsulating state, you know, uh, um, that, that made it completely obvious and, uh, you know, uh, that, 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 that you were violating the laws of the universe by using these things. And, uh, but state's really important because it's hard to affect change in the world in the, in the program environment without changing state. Um, in the Lispy world, um, we love functions, but we're not so blindly functional that um, uh, you know, we take everything to, all the way to the ground there. And so, there, you know, so there's statefulness 
in lots of places, and it's uh, uh, you, so you don't really get exposed to where where the statey parts of it and the non state parts of it, or like enclosure. Um, when have I crossed over into the you know when I'm using the libraries in the JVM, um, statefulness abounds, right? And so um, uh, you know you, 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 those boundaries aren't nearly as clear. In Haskell, it's a religious issue about I think uh, not really a formal issue about making that distinction. Very formal. Yeah, I would definitely agree. And then that's where you also see the differences in the different lists uh, in how they address the state. Uh, like in the land of list, the first thing he does is he starts off with state. So we're going to set these variables and then we're going to do things with them. Um, and it's like, whoa, that's not right. It should be functional at this point. But, you know, it's like, hey, you know. Let's get right to it. Whereas in closure, the idea is to push all the state, sweep it over into this one spot, so that you know this is where things will be bad. So at least you only have it right here. Right. Any other questions, comments? Observe. I don't know. Yeah. What's it? What hands for what? Raise for both. <laughs> right hand for car, left hand for computer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I. Um, uh, every time, so I, I'm now in charge of a, a, a herd of interns, which uh, I'm just loving. It's so fun to be the old guy on the on the team, right? To, and they keep asking me, what should I what should I learn next? And you know, it's like, okay, how good your git? Okay, your git's good, now you can go on the list. It's like, really? Am I, uh, am I gonna be using the list? No. Nope. But you should learn it anyway. Just try it this one. Because um, I do think it's got some um, I do think it's good for all uh, uh, everyone to kind of learn and try something different. Um, the other analogy I have is, you know, you call someone who speaks two languages is bilingual. You know what you call someone who speaks one language, right? American. <laughs> it's probably a good idea to kind of break that stereotype and learn something a little different is going to help you in that. Well, thanks a lot.